Okay, uh, good uh, morning or afternoon, uh, whatever time it is, wherever you are. Um, I am doing the video walkthrough for uh, set two, paper 3H. That's paper 3 uh, higher. It's a calculator paper, as you can see here, there's a calculator symbol, um, so here's my calculator. Um, this video will be split into three sections, uh, um, seven questions in each section. So I'm going to first go through questions one to seven. Um, obviously, you're welcome to skip to whichever question that you want help with. Okay, question one. Um, each year, excuse me, each year Wenford Hospital records how long patients wait to be treated in accident emergency. Uh, in 2015, patients waited 11% less time than in 2014. In 2015, the average time they waited was 68 minutes. Work out the average they waited in 2014. Give your answer to the nearest minute. Okay, so a pretty straightforward question, uh, as you'd expect for question one. Hopefully, um, you guys agree. Uh, you need to read the question carefully. Uh, they've told you that in 2015, patients waited 11% less time than in 2014. And in 2015, this was 68 minutes. So if I write that down, 11% less gave me 68 minutes. Now think about what 11% less means. 11% less, if I take 11% off of 2014 and if I refer to that as 100%, then what I'm basically saying to you is that 89%, because that's what's left, 100% take away 11% is 68 minutes. Now I want to turn that back into 100%. So the simplest way to do that would be uh, divide by 89, which will give me 1%, divide by 89 and uh, then times it by 100 and that will give me 100 percent so what the original 2014 time was um, and obviously we're expecting that the answer to be bigger than 68 minutes because if, if if in 2015 it was less and that was 68 then the last year was more than 68 um, let's have a look there so 89 uh, sorry not 89 68 divided by 89 that gives me some horrible decimal, uh, 0 0.76 blah 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 minutes. Now I'm going to multiply that by 100. And that gives me 76.0, uh, uh, sorry, 76.40449 blah 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 minutes. And it says to the nearest minute, so 76 minutes. Done. Um, next. The hospital has a target to reduce the average time patients uh, wait to be treated in A&E to 60 minutes. Work out the percentage dis decrease from 68 to 60. Very simple formula. Um, percentage change is uh, change over original times 100. So that's how you work out percentage change. So the percentage decrease is the difference. What's the difference between 8 and 60? Well, that's 8. Divided by the original, um, well the original is what it starts at, and then times 100. So 8 divided by 68 times 100. Um, gives me 11.76, so 11.764705. Now when they don't tell you what to round it to, which they don't here, um, my advice is uh, always go to 3SF. So 3SF is your sort of your standard go-to rounding. If they don't tell you what to round it to, go with three significant figures. So 1, 2, 3, 6 is going to make this go up. So that's 11.8%. That's an 11.8% change. Okay. Question... Two, there are only red pens and blue pens in a box. There are 12 red pens. The probability uh, of taking a blue pen is two thirds. Work out the total number of pens in the box. Well, um, I've got red and I've got blue. And I know that there are 12 red, but I don't know how many blue ones there are. But what I do know is that the probability is two thirds of taking a blue pen. So if the probability of taking a blue pen is two thirds, then the probability of taking a red pen must be one third. The reason I know that is because it has to add up to make three thirds, 100%. It has to add up to make that um, because there's only red and blue in there. So 12 represents a third. Well, how do I turn one third into two thirds? I've times it by two. So 12 times two gives me 24. So I know that there are 24 blue pens. Um, 
Work out the total number of pens. Well, 12 plus 24. Total number of pens is 36. All right, and that's the answer, 36. Question three. Question three says, each length of the side of the square uh, B is twice the length of the side of the square A. John says this means the area of the square is twice the area uh, is, 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 is twice the area of square A. Is he right? Um, I, I know the answer to this is no. Um, let me show you why. So here's a simple example. Uh, here's a square, and I'm going to say it's 5. So 5, 5, 5, 5. The area of this square is 25 centimeters squared, for example. Now, if I've got a square that's twice as big, so instead of being 5, it's 10. Instead of being 5 across, it's 10. So there's my, sorry, there's my bigger square. Um, this one is 10, 10, 10, and 10. Uh, 10 times 10 is 100. Now, it's clear then that it's not twice the area. 25 times 2 would be 50. So it's not twice the area. It's actually four times the area. Okay? So I'm going to write John is wrong. Um, because remember, to find the area, we square the numbers. Uh, because it's a square, 5 times itself, 5 squared. So the multiplier used to be 2. So you times it by 2. You also have to square the multiplier. John is wrong. It is actually... 2 squared times bigger. In other words, 4 times bigger. Okay? So, for example, 25 would be 100. If the square was, I don't know, 2 centimeters by 2 centimeters, that would be 4. When you double the side, you'd get 4 by 4, which would give you 16. So, 4 times bigger. So, basically, the area also has to be uh, squared. You yeah. Um, question four. Show that. Uh, excuse me. Question four. Show that seven and a half take away four and two thirds equals that. Um, lots of ways of doing this. Let's just go with the, uh, the the standard stuff that we should all know. I'm going to turn it into a top heavy fraction first. So seven times two, fourteen plus one, fifteen. Fifteen over two. Four times three, twelve. Twelve plus two. 14, 14 over 3. Now I'm subtracting these two. So I'm going to use cross and smile now. So we 15 times 3, 45. 14 times 2, 28. There's a subtract in the middle, subtract in the middle. Smile, 2 times 3, 6. 45 take away 28 is uh, 17. 17 over 6 is the answer to this question, which uh, at the moment I haven't quite shown it, but I've nearly shown it because how many 6 is going to 17? Uh, the answer is 2. Um, so two whole ones and what's the remainder five so two and five sixths and there you go I've just shown that that sum ends up being the same as that next uh, question five make t the subject of 5t take away g in brackets equals 2t plus 7 so to make t the subject I need to get t on its own that's what that means Okay, so let's do that. Expand the bracket first. That'll give me 5t take away 5g equals 2t plus 7. Now I want to bring the t's all on one side. The way to do that is to subtract 2t from both sides. Okay, that cancels that out on this side and on this side leaves you with 3t take away 5g equals 7. Just 7 on its own. Now I want to move the 5g over to the other side. So I'm going to add 5g and add 5g. Now that will give me 3t equals 7 plus 5g. And finally, to get the t on its own, that's what that says, get t on its own, I need to divide by 3, because that will get rid of this, divide by 3, and that will give me t equals 7 plus 5g, all divided by 3. So answer, t equals 7 plus 5g over 3. Question six. Henry is thinking about having a water meter. These are the only two ways he can pay for the water he uses. Um, if he gets a water meter, it'll cost £28.20. That's a fixed charge. Plus 91.22 pence for every cubic meter of water that he uses. Uh, Henry uses an average of 180 litres of water each day. 
Henry wants to pay as little water, as little as possible for the water users should he have a water meter. So we've got option one here, and we've got option two here. Option two is pretty straightforward, just £107 a year. Now, um, in terms of real life, uh, you know, th those of us who are a little bit lazy uh, might just go with that and not even think about it. Those of us who are interested in trying to save some money and save some money on, on bills which you know, is always something that everybody has to pay, we'll probably look into at least investigating whether it's worth it. So let's see if we can figure out if it's worth it. Um, first thing first, he uses 180 litres each day, okay? And one cubic metre is a thousand litres. So let's see if we can work out how many cubic metres he uses in a year, okay? Because I want to compare a per year cost with a per year cost for water meter, all right? So, if you use 180 litres a day, there are um, 356 years, uh, days in a year. Mr. Shea's going crazy. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right. So I'm going to times it by 356. Here we go. This is a calculated paper, remember. So 180 times 356. That is how much water he uses in uh, litres in a year. So that is liters. Now I am going to uh, divide it by a thousand. So divide by a thousand and that will turn it into cubic meters. So that is 64, excuse me, 64, that's messy, 64.08 cubic meters. Okay, that's wonderful, right? I've just worked out how many cubic meters of water this fella Henry uses in a year. Now, for each one of those, he has to pay 91.22 pence. So 64.08 multiplied by 91.22 91 pence tells me how many pence he has to pay per year. So let's do that. 64.08 times 91.22 pence. So that is 5,845 pence, 0.3776. Now, frankly, um, I don't like this because that is in pence, but it's a decimal and, and it's messy. So let's divide it by 100 to turn it into pounds. And that gives me 58 pounds and 45 pence. Okay. Now, the reason I'm ignoring all of this is because, as you should know, money is always two decimal places, pounds and pence. Uh, there's no need for me to write 3776. That's irrelevant. Okay. So all of that doesn't really matter. So 58 pound 45 is the... Is the um, is the water based usage charge and then there's a fixed amount to add on 28 pound 20 which we add on to that as well so i'm going to now do this 58 pounds and 45 pence plus uh 20 uh pounds and 20 pence 28 pounds and 20 pence and that gives me a total price of 86 pounds and 65 pence so what I'm really comparing then is I've got option one, which is the water meter option, which costs £86.65. And then I've got option two, which is the no water meter option. And that cost me, um, excuse me, £107. So should he have a water meter? The answer is yes, he should install a meter. Um, and there you go. That's uh, the answer to question six. Okay then. Question seven, which is the last question of this section. Um, Cameron invests £1,200 for three years in a savings account. He gets 4.1% simple interest. Mitchell invests £1,200 in a uh, savings account. He gets 4%. Excuse me. So a slightly lower interest rate, but he gets compound interest, which is much better. Who will have the most money in, in the account? So uh, if it were me doing a question like this, I would split my page into two. I've got Cameron and I've got Mitchell. Maybe he's one of the Mitchell brothers. No, I'm joking. Right. Um, Cameron invests 1,200, 4.1% interest. So I need to work out what 4.1% is, okay? So 1,200 uh, is being invested, but I want 4.1%. Now the easiest way to do this is to divide it by 100 and then times it by uh, 4.1. So I'll just write that. I'm going to divide it by 100, that will give me 1%, and then I'm going to times it by 4.1, and that will give me 
4.1%. So 1,200, excuse me, 1,200 divided by 100, that's 1%, 1 times 4.1, 49 pound 20 pence. 49 pound 20 pence. I've just worked out how much 4.1% um, is. Now he gets that for three years, so times it by three. So take that answer, times it by three. That gives me 147 pounds and 60 pence. And then obviously add on the amount that the guy started with. Um, and that's 1,347 pounds 60 pence. Nice and straightforward. That's the total for this fella at the end of three years. Now for Mitchell, who's got compound interest, I'm just going to remind you of the formula, which is amount times rate to the power of n, n being years. And rate, I should also probably write multiplier. You might also see it as that. Um, so amount times multiplier or rate to the power of years. So in Mitchell's case, uh, again, he's starting with the same amount. The multiplier for 4% interest, well, if I've got 100% and I add 4%, that gives me 104%. Now I'm going to divide it by 100 to get my rate, 1.04. That's my multiplier, 1.04. So times 1.04, and it's three years, so power of three. One uh, step of working out, literally just that. 1,200 times 1.04 to the power of three. And Mitchell ends up with 1,349 pounds and 80 four pence to two decimal places remember that's a six there so that rounds that three up okay uh, so I'm comparing uh, this number here with this number here so who's gonna have most money is it Cameron or is it Mitchell hopefully you guys can clearly see it's Mitchell Mitchell has more right Question eight. Uh, here are the four, first four terms of an arithmetic sequence. Find in terms of n an expression for the nth term. Now, uh, the method that a lot of you will know, hopefully, is the Dunno method. Okay. D stands for difference. N, you just write n, and zero would be the zero term if I went back one. Okay. So zero term. And this is the first term, second term, third term. Okay. So. Um, the difference each time, well, it's going up clearly in sevens. So seven n. So I know my answer is going to be seven n something. Now the zero term will tell me what, what is the something. Is it plus something? Is it minus something? Well, if I go back one, instead of adding seven each time, instead of adding seven, I'd have to take away seven. Three take away seven. Think about a number line. It's going to be a minus number. That's right, minus four. So therefore the nth term for this is seven n minus four. Next question. Is 150 in the sequence? Um, easiest way, year 11, to do this is to use the nth term that you just worked out, write down equals 150, and see if n comes out as a normal number. Okay? As in a whole number. So, when I substitute a number in for n, when I work out n, if it's a whole number, then the answer is going to be yes, it's in the sequence. If it's a decimal, then the answer is going to be no, it's not in the sequence. So, Solve that equation. That will give me 7n equals 154. Divide by 7. 154 divided by 7 is 22. So divide by 7, divide by 7. n equals 22. So the answer is yes. Uh, it is the 22nd term in the sequence. So what I've just done is use the nth term to work out whether it's in the sequence. Effectively, if I put 22 in there, if I do 7 lots of 22 and then take away 4, the answer will be 150. 7 times 22, take away 4. Yep, so it does come in the sequence. It's the 22nd number in the sequence. If I keep this going 22 times, eventually I'll end up with 150. Question 9. Here are the marks that uh, James uh, scored in 11 maths tests. Find the interquartile range. Okay. So the interquartile range is defined as the upper quartile, take away the lower quartile. I'll just write that down. Upper quartile, subtract lower quartile. Um, so what I think I'll first do 
is I'm going to rewrite that list of numbers. I'm just going to write them in order because you, you do need to put them in order first. All right, so I'm going to rewrite this list, but in order. So starting with the lowest, um, 11. Next is a 12. Next, I've got two 13s. Next, I've got uh, a 16. Next, I've got two 17s. Next, I've got uh, one 18. Next, I've got two 19s. And finally, I've got a 20. So that is the list in order now. Now, to find the upper and lower quartiles, you basically do what you'd normally do for the median. So we're going to cross out from either side, one at a time. So there's one, two, three, four, five crosses. So I've just worked out that 17 is the median. Okay, 17. Now, I'm going to cross again, just looking at these numbers, I'm going to do the same thing again to find out the lower quartile. So I'll do smallest and biggest, smallest and biggest. That is the lower quartile. And then I'll do the same thing on the right hand side here to work out the upper quartile. So smallest, biggest, smallest, biggest. That is the upper quartile. So I've just worked out the upper quartile, the median, and the lower quartile. Now, to find the interquartile range, I need to do upper, take away lower. So 19, take away 13, answer 6. So the interquartile range is 6. Next question. Sunil did the same 11 math test. The median that he got is 17. His interquartile range is 8. Which one of them has more consistent marks? Um, consistency is measured using the range or the interquartile range, okay, IQR or, or range. Um, so if I said to you who did better on average, then you'd compare the average, right? You'd compare, you know, the mean or the median. Now in this case, the median, 17, uh, James, same median. So I can't say who's better based on the averages, but I can say who is more consistent because, you know, it's one thing if I can get, you know, a grade nine, congratulations, but if you get a grade nine in one test and then the next week you get a grade one, um, then that means you're not very consistent. It means that your revision isn't very good or it means that you were just very lucky or the, maybe you cheated or maybe, you know, there's lots of other things that could be the case. Whereas if you're consistently getting grade sixes or grade sevens, it's clear that that is the grade you're working at. So, consistency is the range or the interquartile range. Now, in this case, interquartile range is 8. So, Sunil has a bigger interquartile range than James. So, who is more consistent? The answer is James is more consistent. And the reason I'm going to say that is because his interquartile range is lower than Sunil's. Okay? So, if you've got a low interquartile range or a low range, that means your data isn't very spread out. So that means it's more consistent. Next, Sunil did four maths tests. His scores in the four tests were 16, 20, excuse me. Sorry, four more maths tests. His scores in these were 16, 20, 18, and 10. How does his new median compare with his old median? Um, so, the simplest um, way to, to, to look at this or to work this out is to assess um, the numbers that you've got and how that will affect the existing median. So Sunil used to have a median of 17 in 11 tests. Now to work out the median, you'd put the numbers in order and you'd cross them out, right? So what you've really got to ask yourself is, how do these numbers look in his list? If you've got a list of numbers, um, just like we have up, up here for the first question, right? We have a list of James's numbers, and that was the middle number. If I add a few numbers into this list, how will that affect it? Well, it depends if they're before the 17 or if they're after the 17. So ask yourself that question. Look at these numbers. I've got one, two that are less than 17, and I've got one, two that are more than 17. So that means, basically, um, I'm adding two on the right-hand side and I'm adding two on the left-hand side. So when I cross them out, 
it makes no difference. So the new median is 17. Okay, that's what I'm going to tick. And the answer, the explanation, sorry, is um, uh, two of those scores, two of the new scores are above 17 and two are below 17 therefore no change to median because remember you're going to cross them out above and below anyway so eventually you'll end up in the same the same place you'll end up in the middle and it's still 17 right question 10 oh lovely okay um work out oh so show that that is the case um area of a trapezium let's just write that down first area of trapezium nice easy or i say easy nice simple formula here is the formula um you're going to do half bracket a plus b times by h so a and b are the two parallel sides so this is a this is b and this is the height so i'm going to write down half of 3x plus 1 plus 5x plus 3 times by the height, which is 2x plus 3. Okay. Um, close that bracket. Now, let's deal with this bracket first. So, collect the terms together. Um, the half stays where it is. 3x plus 5x is 8x. 1 plus 3 is 4. And I'm times in that bracket by 2x plus 3. Half of that bracket then is 4x plus 2, and I'm times in that bracket by 2x plus 3. Now I'm going to expand the bracket using FOIL. FOIL, remember, stands for first, outside, inside, last. First, 4 times 2, 8, x times x, x squared. Outside, 4 times 3, 12, x. Inside, 2 times 2, 4x. And then last, 2 times 3, 6. Collect the terms together. That gives me 8x squared plus 16x plus 6. Now that is area of trap trapezium. Okay. And the question tells you what the area is. It tells you it's 46. So let's write that down. 8x squared plus 16x plus 6 equals 46. And now they want me to turn it into that. At the moment, this doesn't look much like this. But but you can see, hopefully, that if I bring the 46 over, that will make it equal 0, which is our first stage. So let's do that. Take away 46. Take away 46. That gives me 8x squared plus 16x uh, minus 40 equals 0. And then finally, there is one step that we can do to rearrange this thing here to make it look like this. Hopefully you can see all of these numbers come in the 8 times table. So if I multiply, sorry, if I divide through by 8, that will turn that into 1x squared, it will turn that into 2x, and it will turn that into 5, which I think is what they wanted me to show. There you go. x squared, 2x, and minus 5. x squared, 2x, minus 5. Done. Part B. Solve that equation. Give your solutions correct to two decimal places. Um, given that this is a calculator paper, I and, and they've even given you a hint here and said decimal places, I'm going to jump straight to using the quadratic formula. I'm going to write that down here. Quadratic formula. Oh, formula. Now, the quadratic formula looks like this. Minus B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a and uh, to use this I need to know what a is what b is and what c is and um, the standard form of this is ax squared plus bx plus c so in this case a is the number in front of this which is 1 when it's on its own it's just 1x squared b is the number in front of this 2 and c is the number here which is minus 5 so I've now got my three numbers now, uh, I'll say again, the reason I've gone straight to using this, I haven't bothered trying to factorize it or use completing the square or any other method, because they've told me two decimal places and because it's a calculator paper, and probably because I'm a math teacher, I know that that means it's probably going to be a um, uh, quadratic formula question. So, let's 
try and use the formula then. I'm going to substitute these three numbers into this formula using brackets. Okay, so everywhere I see a B, I'm going to use 2. Everywhere I see an A, I'm going to use 1. Everywhere I see a C, I'm going to use minus 5. Here we go. Minus 2 plus or minus the square root of 2 squared minus 4 times 1 times minus 5. All divided by 2 times 1. That is the quadratic formula substituted. Now, I could go straight to my calculator now, but I'm not going to. As I've explained to my year 11s, uh, well, I was about to say, as I've explained to my year 11s, I don't teach year 11 higher this year, but um, as I would explain to you if I did teach you year 11 higher, um, don't jump straight into using a calculator at this stage. You're more likely to make a silly mistake. What I would do is use your brains for a minute, and, well, minus 2, I can just write minus 2, plus or minus stays as it is, square root, 2 squared, you all should know that's 4, 4 times 1 is 4, 4 times 5 is 20, and I've got a minus times a minus, so that ends up being plus 20, divided by 2 times 1 is 2, and then I can simplify it a tiny bit more, um, which I'll do, making it minus 2 plus or minus the square root of 24, divided by 2. And now I've got to just put that in a calculator. Now remember there's two solutions, plus or minus, so uh, I'll split it into two and I've got minus 2 plus root 24 divided by 2, minus 2 minus root 24 divided by 2. And you're going to have a solution on that side and a solution on this side. Here we go. Fraction minus 2 plus root 24 divided by 2 gives me uh, 1.44948974 um, and they said to two decimal places so that is uh, 1.45 or on this side so I'll do the same again minus 2 minus root 24 divided by Oh, sorry, I meant to write a fraction. Oops, a daisy. Oops, let's start again. Fraction button first. Minus 2 minus root 24 divided by 2. This one will give me minus 3.44948974. Two decimal places is minus 3.45. Okay. And that's the answer to question 10. Question uh, 11. The diagram shows Diana's suitcase. The suitcase is in the shape of a cuboid. Diana has a walking stick which folds. The folded walking stick excuse me, has a length of 60. She wants to put this in the suitcase. Will it fit? Um, so this question requires you to think about whether a, uh, a walking stick will fit into a box, effectively. Now, the longest length in a box, because obviously 60, it's not going to fit sideways. 45 is the width of this, so I can't fit it in by putting it in like this because it's longer than 45, so the edges will stop it. But the longest length inside a, uh, a 3D uh, rectangle, a cuboid, is always a diagonal. And the diagonal that's longest is from the front corner to the back corner. Okay, or vice versa. So this front corner to this back corner, but I'm going to go with this one. So this is the longest diagonal in there. And if you can see what I've just drawn for you, that is a right angle triangle. It cuts through the shape. So what I need to work out is this length here, x. And if that length is longer than 60, then the answer is yes, Diana, this, this folding, folded walking stick will fit inside your box, your briefcase. If, however, x is less than 60, then the answer will be no, it doesn't fit. So let's work out x. How do I work out x? Well, using Pythagoras. How do I use Pythagoras? Well, you need to know two sides. a squared plus b squared will give me c squared. Now, I know a, but I don't know this one. I'll call it b. I don't know what the other short side is. So, let's now look at this triangle. Maybe in another color, Mr. Shape, would be sensible. Uh, red. So um, I have another triangle just here. Hopefully you can see that. And that's also a right angle triangle. So 
Uh, if I call this triangle 1, and then I call the other one, the, the green one, triangle 2, let's do triangle 1 first. Triangle 1 looks like this. It's 20 uh, centimeters, it's 45 centimeters, and it's B. I'm calling it B. And then triangle 2 looks like uh, this. It's 30 centimeters, it's B, and it's X. So, let's first use Pythagoras here to work out B, and then use that answer here to work out X. And once I've got X, if it's bigger than 60, then I can tell Diana, congratulations, you can fit your walking stick inside your box. Here we go. 45 squared plus 20 squared, and square root the answer. Simple Pythagoras. Answer, 49.24428, blah, blah, blah. Leave it in your calculator because you're going to use that down here now. 49.24428. Um, so now to for this one, I'm going to go answer squared plus 30 squared and square root that answer. So square it plus 30 squared and square root that answer. And I get 57.6628127, uh, which I'll round to uh, one decimal place, 57.7 centimeters. So what I've just worked out then, year 11, is that this length here, which is this length here, is 57.7. Now that is the longest possible length inside that 3D shape. So will it fit inside the uh, suitcase? No the walking oh, sorry walking stick won't fit and that's it hopefully that made sense um, <clears throat> so there is actually a typo on this question apologies uh, this here is meant to say uh, 10 to the power of 10 so uh, just be aware of that now, the question says the surface area of Earth is uh, that, big number, and the surface area of Jupiter is that, another big number. Uh, surface area of Jupiter is greater than the surface area of Earth, how many times greater? So effectively, uh, I'm going to be doing area of uh, Jupiter divided by area of Earth, that's what they want to know how many times greater so to work that out I need to divide the bigger one by the smaller one so I mean we can do that you know on a calculator uh, it is a calculator paper after all so 6.21795 times 10 to the power of 10 divided by 510072000 so I've just taken these two numbers and written them uh, as that and I'm going to do that now uh, with a calculator so you can all see it in fact I'll, I'll use the fraction button instead of the divide just so you can see them both hopefully at the same time 6.21795 times uh, 10 to the power of 10 divided by 510072000 um, and that gives me an answer of uh, 121.9033783 which it asked me to give in standard form so for standard form it needs to be uh, between 1 and 9 this is for standard form between 1 and 9 um, and then it's gonna it's gonna have a, a times 10 to the power of something effectively how many decimal places how many points do I need to move the decimal place so um, let's uh, let's do that now. So that will be 1.21903378. So you'll notice I've just moved the decimal place two places. So I'm going to have times 10 to the power of two. Um, and that's the answer. Done. It doesn't ask you to round it. So, I mean, yeah, you you wouldn't lose a mark if if I rounded that to I don't know 1.22, for example times 10 to the power of 2 that's uh, acceptable but uh, I'm gonna leave it with all the decimal places uh, in this case question 13 Brian's band is playing a concert 
um, sorry, at, at a concert in a hall. The loudness of the band varies inversely as the square of the distance from the band. Interesting. Brian measures the normal loudness as 100 decibels at a distance of 5. The band has to stop playing if the loudness is 85 decibels or more at a distance of 5.4 meters. Does the band have to stop playing? Um, so, um, I am going to uh, start by forming the, um, the inverse, inverse proportion equation. So, um, when it says inversely proportional to the square, so if it was direct proportion, you'd write y fish x, for example. That means y is directly proportional to x. If it says inversely proportional, then you write y fish 1 over x. So, this is direct proportion. And this is indirect or inverse proportion. Um, so I'm going to use this formula, except instead of, um, and, and let's call it uh, L and D. So the loudness varies inversely to the square of the distance, so D squared. So what I'm going to do then is say L fish 1 over D squared. Okay? Loudness is inversely proportional to the square of the distance, d squared. <coughs> now, um, you can replace the fish with equals k. So L equals k over d squared. And now to work out k, you're going to use the pair they give you, 105. Okay. So um, I'm going to write um, 100 equals k divided by 5 squared. So 100 equals k divided by 25 times by 25, 2500 equals k. Okay, so that is an important part of my answer. So moving on then back to, to this step, um, I'll just sort of put a box around that. That's important. I'll write that again, but this time I've worked out k. So 2500 is called the constant of proportionality, and that is my starting point. So or my middle middle of the question but starting point for the next part of the question now the question says the band has to stop playing if the loudness is 85 decibels or more at a distance of 5.4 meters so um, what I'm going to do is put 5.4 in here and see if my answer comes out as 85 or more loudness if the answer is yes it's going to be more than um, uh, 85 decibels then they have to stop if it's less than 85, then they don't have to stop. So I'm going to do 2,500 divided by 5.4 squared. I'm going to put that in our calculator now. 2,500 divided by uh, 5.4 squared. That gives us an answer of 85.7, blah, blah, blah. And the question does clearly say the band has to stop playing if the loudness is 85 or more. Now that is slightly more than 85, but the point is it's more. So, uh, therefore, <coughs> excuse me, uh, band has to stop. Band has to oh, excuse me, stop. All right. The question is asking us to find uh, this angle here. Uh, it talks about uh, QR, ST, points on the circle circumference. Uh, STR is 26, RQT is 73, work out the size of STA, so hat on the T, it's this angle, S to T to A, um, and give a reason for each stage and you're working out. Now, uh, the theorem involved here, this topic is circle theorems, it is a complicated uh, topic, um, but it's a case of memorizing a bunch of rules, basically, um, year 11, so uh, let me just grab a scrap, <coughs> excuse me, a scrap piece of paper. Um, so I can draw, hopefully, uh, the theorem for you. So the theorem that we're going to use in this case is the alternate segment theorem. Now the alternate segment theorem states, um, if I just draw you a simple sort of triangle there. So the alternate segment theorem states, um, it's a really bad drawing, but there it is, uh, that this angle here, x, will be the same as this angle here, x. And this angle here, y, will be the same as this angle here, y. Um, 
I think the, the, the simplest way while we're you know trying to teach through a video is, is just to say that you need to memorize that. The, 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 the specific wording of the theorem is that the angles formed um, uh, between the tangent uh, by, by the tangent are equal to the uh, angle in the opposite segment. So this is one segment here and this is the alternate segment. So that's why they call it the alternate segment theorem. Um, yeah. Now, um, apply that to this question. So look at that diagram and see how it's similar to this. Now, my advice would be for a moment, just ignore this, uh, the, these lines here. Um, so if I said to you then that this angle here, this whole thing, is equal to this angle here, this whole thing. That's what I'm basically saying, yeah? So um, y is equal to y. Now, if you know that this is 73, and this must also be 73, to work out this little section here, you basically need to do 73, take off the 26. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do 73, take away 26 to give me uh, an answer here. Um, and that gives me 47 degrees and that is uh, the correct answer give a reason for each stage um, honestly uh, you'd say um, because of the alternate segment theorem is probably the the safest uh, simplest rather way to to say that and you'd write is uh, alternate segment theorem Okay, um, yeah, that's probably the, the, the most basic thing I can say for now. If you want some more practice on this, and I would strongly advise you to, to get some more practice on this topic, um, if you're in set one certainly, is uh, have a watch of our videos on the YouTube channel or on Maths Watch if there aren't any on the YouTube channel yet. Um, yeah, just practice, 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 practice. Instagram shows information about the times in minutes that some passengers had to wait at an airport. Question at the bottom there is work out the percentage of the passengers who had to wait for more than an hour. Um, right. So a nice, uh, nice enough question. Um, I can't uh, zoom out, unfortunately. I can maybe try and just pick this up a touch. Yeah. So um, work out the percentage of the passengers who. Uh, who had to wait for more than an hour so more than an hour is here onwards yeah so all of these passengers now I'll just remind you with a histogram area equals frequency so what I need to do really is work out the area of all of these bars okay so I'm gonna do that first so 20 times 12 for this one 20 times 12 this one is 10 times uh, 10 point uh, 8 10 times 10.8. This one here is uh, 10, 12, 14, 15 times 7. This one here is uh, from 45 up to 60. So again, 15 times 5. This one here is 30 times by 1.8. And this last one here is 30 times 0 0.6. So um, I've just written in each bar the, the width times the height. Okay, now I'm going to use my calculator and actually work those out. So 20 times 12, frequency of this one, I'll write it at the top of each bar, 240. 10 times 10.8, nice and easy, 108. 15 times 7, 105. 15 times 5, 75. Uh, 30 times 1.854 and 30 times 0 0.618. So I've just worked out all of the areas. Now, to work out the percentage of the people who had to wait for more than an hour, what I want is these two, so 54 plus 18, which is uh, 60, 72. And what I basically got to do is 72 out of total times 100. That's going to be my, my, my bit of working out. 72 divided by the total times 100. So now the total is all of the bars. Yeah. So 240 plus 108 plus 105 plus 75 plus 54 plus 18. I just need to add all these bars together. 240, 108, 105, 75, 54 and 18 gives me a total of 600. So 72 divided by 600 
times 100. Apologies, sorry guys, I haven't scrolled it down there. So I've just added all the bars together to get the total, and then I'm doing that sum there. 72 divided by 600 times 100. So here we go. 72 divided by 600 times 100. Answer 12%. So 12% of the passengers, that's these two bars out of the total. 12% had to wait for more than an hour. Question 16. Given that 2 to the half, 2 to the n, uh, equals 2 to the x divided by 8 to the y, express n in terms of x and y. So this is a question uh, on indices. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple question, uh, guys. Um, it just looks quite complicated. Um, mainly uh, because you've got uh, a, a number here that isn't um, in terms of 2. So you are, you, you are aware that if I have, I don't know, x to the 6 divided by x to the 3, you just take away the powers, that gives you x to the 3. But when I've got x on the top and another number like y at the bottom, like here, 2 and 8 at the bottom, it's a bit more complicated. So um, let's first deal with the left-hand side. What do you do with brackets and powers? And the answer is you multiply them. So how do you multiply a fraction and a whole number? Well, you would effectively call this n over 1, and you multiply straight across with fractions. So 1 times n and 2 times 1. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to end up with 2 to the n over 2. All right, I've just multiplied the two fractions there. 1 times n, so this is what I've done. 1 times n and 2 times 1, okay, which is n over 2. And on the other side, I'm going to rewrite the bottom number Instead of writing 8, I'm going to write this as 2 cubed, because 2 cubed is 8. But now, because I've got the same number at the top and the same number at the bottom, well, I will eventually, um, I've now got an index form that I can, I can do something with. Um, again, with brackets, you multiply the powers. So that's the same. Uh, I'll leave this side as it is, n over 2. This side is 2 to the x over... 2 to the 3y. Okay, so now what I'm really saying uh, when I write something like this here, I subtract the powers, yeah, dividing um, base numbers that are the same, you subtract the powers. So 2 to the n over 2 is equal to 2 to the x take away 3y. Hope we're all good up to that stage. Now the last bit then really is to, um, well, if I'm, if I'm telling you the base number here and the base number here are identical, that means that this index section is equal to this index section. So I'm just going to write now a new equation, n over 2 is equal to x minus 3y. And it says express n. What that means is get n on its own. So how do I get n on its own? What do I need to do to both sides here? The opposite of divide by 2, which is times by 2, both sides giving me n equals 2x minus 6y. And that's the answer to that question. All right, question 17. OK, um, this is a question on uh, vectors. Question says OAB is a triangle. OA is A, OB is B. Find A to B in terms of A and B. Uh, vectors year 11 are... Um, are a topic which are easier than they might first seem. Um, I um, I quite like this topic. It speaks to, to um, the, the part of me that always sort of found physics quite an interesting subject um, and engineering and that sort of thing. But really what you're thinking about here is, um, I tend to think of this as like a map and roads or routes. So how do I get from A to B? And many of you will say, oh, you just go straight up this line. Well, yeah, but I don't know how to go up that line. I don't know anything to do with this line. What I do know is I know A and I know B. So how do I get from A to B? Well, you go back along A. So if this direction pointing that way is positive A, then going that way would be negative A. OK, so I'm going that way and then I'm going to go up B. So effectively, minus A plus B. Now, with it, um, vectors, you just put, uh, you underline the letter. Um, obviously, uh, they write them in bold. That's effectively the same thing. I can't write in bold because I'm writing by hand. So you underline the letters. Next, um, now these, these questions are always a little bit more difficult, but 
go with my sort of map and route analogy and that may help you. P is the point on uh, AB such that AP to B, PB is 3 to 1. In other words, this is in the ratio 3 to 1 or if it helps, this is 3 quarters of this line and this is 1 quarter of this line. Okay? Next, if I just put a dotted line here, so 3 quarters is up to that point and this bit is 1 quarter from there to there. Uh, find O to P. Okay, well, I'm going to write it like this. I'm going to say O to P is O to B plus B to P. Yeah, O to P is from me going up this road and then down this road. Now, as I said before, I don't know enough. I don't know much about this road, except now that I do know something, because it said a little bit more, gave me a little bit more information here. It said that this is a quarter of the whole thing. So B to P, I'll just draw an arrow, is a quarter of B to A. Okay. So how do I get from B to A? Well, B to A is down B and along A. So B to A. That would mean it's a quarter of minus B plus A. All right. So um, a quarter of minus B is minus a quarter B. Is, I should have underlined, apologies. And a quarter of A is, well, a quarter of A. So that's that bit done. So I can, I've got what B to P is. That is B to P which I'd say is probably the hardest part of the question because the rest now OB they've given you that in the question how do I get from O to B you move along B so uh, this is then O to P equals B plus um, minus a quarter B plus a quarter A now what is 1B plus and minus next to each other is, is effectively becomes a minus so B take away a quarter B that leaves me with three quarters B plus one quarter A and that is the answer to the question yeah. um, oh it does say give it in simplest form so I suppose there's one more step you could do which is you could um, factorize it uh, what I mean is uh, take a quarter out of a bracket leaving you inside with three B plus 1a because if I expand this by a quarter then that will turn it back into that so I'd, I'd probably say that is your final answer okay question 18 um, the sketch shows the curve with the equation y equals k a to the power of x where k and a are constants a is bigger than zero the curve passes through these two points calculate the value of k and the value of a. Uh, okay, so this is a uh, exponential curve. That's what the topic is called. Um, exponential curve. Uh, you'll be familiar with the word exponential, I hope. Um, certainly, it comes up in, in uh, biology um, and also in real life here and there. Um, you know, COVID cases are rising exponentially, etc., etc. You might you may hear this sort of thing. Now, um, what it re really means is it is. Um, it rises at a very a very fast rate uh, and it, com it compounds upon itself it, 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 meaning that um, um, the more there are the quicker it grows um, so that's why this graph very quickly rises up so uh, the way to do it then is using this and using the two points you have start by substituting the first point the reason you choose the first point is because x is 1 and um, as you should know, anything to the power of one is um, is itself is just a. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do then is write seven equals k a to the power of one, which is seven equals k a. That's what I've just worked out. Uh, then three and one seven five. So this time I'm going to write one seven five equals k a cubed okay so now I'm going to uh, use these two things and I'm gonna um, rearrange this first one to get K on its own so how do I get K on its own I'd have to divide both sides 
by a. So what I'm uh, going to do is write 7 divided by a is equal to k. And then I'm going to put that in the second equation. I've just worked out a, a different way of writing k, which is 7 over a, and I'm going to put that in here. 175 equals 7 divided by a, a cubed, times a cubed effectively, right? Um, which, uh, again, you can uh, rearrange a bit. If I'm dividing by a, and here I'm timesing by a three times, I can basically cancel that a out and make it a squared. So what that becomes is 175 equals 7a squared. Okay, now I'm going to divide both sides by 7. And that will give me um, 175 divided by 7. So that will give me 25 equals a squared. And then I'm going to square root both sides, which will give me 5. So I've just worked out that a is 5. Now, to work out k, uh, I can just put that into that equation, actually, because I've got an equation here for k. So um, I'll do 7 divided by 5, which is 1.4. And there's your answer to k. Okay, question 19 is next. Question 19, A and B are two straight lines. Uh, line A has the equation that, line B goes through the points that. Do lines A and B intersect? You must show all your working out. Step 1, rearrange the first uh, line A to make it in this form, y equals mx plus c, just because uh, that is how we're used to seeing lines. So basically divide both sides by 2. That will give me line A is y equals 3x over 2 plus 4. Okay, now step 2, that was step 1. Ooh, step 1 was that. Step 2 is uh, to work out the equation. What is the equation of B? Work out equation of B. And the way to do that is to uh, use the following formula, change in y, excuse me, divided by change in x to work out the gradient. So let's do that. Uh, we'll do, yeah, at the top, I'm going to have 8 take away 2, and at the bottom, I'm going to have 2 minus minus 1. So I've just done 8, y take away y, and x take away x, which will give me 6 divided by 3, which will give me 2. So I've just worked out the gradient of the second line is 2. So I know it's going to be y equals 2x plus something. Now I've got to work out the something. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to substitute one of these two points. Now I personally don't really like negative numbers, so I'm going to use positive numbers. 8 and 2. 8 equals 2 lots of 2 plus something. 8 equals 4 plus something. Take away 4, take away 4. The something is 4. So I've now worked out equation of B equation of b is uh, y equals 2x plus 4. So I've now got equation of uh, a and equation of b in those two boxes. Now what you need to do is check to see if uh, what they have to, uh, whether they equal each other, whether they can equal each other. Um, and the way to do that is to set them equal to each other. Um, although just looking at it now, I'm, I'm having a, a thought. Let me just uh, investigate that thought. Um, what I'm seeing is, uh, because they have the same y-intercept, we can see that they are definitely going to intersect. Because what that means is, guys, that uh, it crosses through 0, 4. And if this one has the same y-intercept, then whatever the gradient is, it might, it might look really shallow, but it also crosses through the same place. So both of these two lines have the same y-intercept. So I'm just going to write, yes, um, they cross at 0, 4, because um, they have the same y-intercept. Um, that feels like perhaps it's a little bit uh, too easy and maybe I made a mistake. So I'm going to check the mark scheme, because I'm beginning to have a little bit of doubts. Um, 
Let me check. Question 19. Yes. Uh, yeah, look at that. That's exactly what it says. Cool. So uh, that's correct. Yeah, they have the same, um, the same wave set. Okay. Right, so question 20 uh, is an advanced trigonometry question. Um, you've been asked to work out the area of triangle ABC and they've only given you two sides and an angle. Uh, but not the angle between the two sides. So because of that, you can't use the cosine rule. What you can do, though, is use the sine rule because you have a matching side and angle, which means I can work out the angle on the other side over here, um, which is what I am going to do. Okay? And then once you've got that, um, you can work out this angle because angles in a triangle add up to 180, and then you can use... Um, half AB sine C to work out the area of the triangle. So let's uh, just go through this one step at a time. So apologies, I've written the wrong formula there. Uh, you can probably tell I, I thought I was going to use the cosine rule here, but no, I'm using the sine rule. So the sine rule says, um, and I'm working out an angle, remember. So if I call this A, this, this is the one I'm finding. So I'm going to write uh, sine A divided by 36 is equal to sine 48 divided by 57. Now, how do I get sine A on its own? I'm going to times by 36. So sine A equals sine 48 over 57 times 36. And then to get A on its own, I'm going to do sine minus 1, all of that stuff. Sine 48 over 57 times 36. So um, that is basically what I'm going to do now. So sine to the minus 1 of sine 48 over 57 times 36. That gives me 27, excuse me, 27.992412111 and that gives me this angle here, 27.99. Now, um, what I'm now going to do is, is work out the missing angle B. Now, angles in a triangle add up to 180. So, what I'll do is I'll um, do 180, take away that answer and take away 48. Okay, so I've just basically done 180, take away this, and this leaves me with angle B, which is 104.00. So I'm going to leave it as 104. Okay, now, now the last formula I need uh, is uh, half AB sine C. So half A and B are the two sides, and sine C is the angle in between, 104. So half of 57 times 36 times sine 104 there we go then uh, half times 57 times 36 times sine 104 all right and that will give me 995.523413 five which to three significant figures is nine nine six meters squared final answer nine nine six right now this looks like a very uh, interesting looking question Ooh, uh, the diagram shows a cylinder inside a cone which is on a horizontal base the cone and the cylinder have the same vertical axis so that means that they, um, uh, there's this, this dotted line effectively goes all the way through. And the base of the cylinder lies on the base of the cone. The circumference of the top face of the cylinder touches the curved surface of the cone. So, I mean, if you like, you could imagine there's a little cone on the top. That's effectively what they're telling us with that last line. The height of the cone is 12, and the radius of the base of the cone is 4. Work out the curved surface area of the cone. So that is a pretty straightforward question, yeah, because they've given you all the information you need. Uh, the second part of this question, I think, is going to be a lot more complicated because the first part is just to do with the cone, not, not to do with this weird shaded cylinder inside it. So uh, curved surface area, yeah? they've given you the formula. All you've got to do is that, pi times r times l. L is the slanted height. 
So there's one little bit of maths you've got to do, and I've been teaching this to my year 10, set 3, so that's foundation year 10, who've been learning this recently. Um, this is Pythagoras. Have a look, my friends. Here you can see a right angle triangle. Hopefully you can all see that just there. Okay? Now, this right angle triangle, I'm going to draw it over here as well. Um, this is 12, that's the height of it. This is 4, that's the radius. And this is L, which is what I need for my pi RL business for this formula. So, 12 squared plus 4 squared, square root it. 12 squared plus 4 squared, square root it, is 12.6491064. And now, I'm going to use pi times radius times that answer. So, pi times radius of 4 times um, answer. So, pi times 4 times answer. And that gives me 158.9534123, which I'm going to round to three significant figures, 159 centimetres squared, remember, because it is area. Sorry, 159 centimetres squared. Now, uh, question 22, um, rather unhelpfully, is on the next page, so I'll need to keep flipping back. Um, you know what? I'm going to do this instead. So apologies. Um, I'm just going to move this here because I think it's it'll be a lot easier for you to understand if I've got the question in front of me. Um, um, this cylinder, okay, uh, has a radius of r. It says that at the bottom there. So I'm just going to draw a dotted line here and I'm going to say r. Now in normal circumstances, to work out the volume of this, I would do pi times r squared. And then I times that by the height. If I just uh, draw an arrow here and say h for height. Um, so in our case, it would be pi r squared h. And what they want me to show, and that would be the volume of that cylinder, they want me to show that that is uh, the same as 12 pi r squared minus 3 pi r cubed. So um, we are going to we are going to try um, uh, and work out uh, h because h is the only thing we've got that they don't have okay we've got v we've got pi r squared we need to work out h so how can we work out h um, so h h um, is the height of this uh, this um, cylinder now, if you think about what's left above it, that would therefore be 12 take away h. Well, the relationship um, is that uh, the relationship between the height and the radius of the larger cone is, um, is the same relationship as the height and the radius of the smaller cone. You see this, this little baby cone on the top? Um, so what I'm basically saying to you is, um, 12 divided by 4, that relationship, that's 3, that is the scale uh, or, the, or the, um, um, the relationship between the height and the radius of the bigger cone. And that is consistent with the height and the radius of the smaller cone. So what I mean by that is uh, the radius of the big cone is three times smaller than the radius than the height of the big cone so that means the radius of the little cone is three times smaller than the radius than the height sorry of the big so if 12 divided by 4 is 3 12 minus h divided by r is also 3 okay so using that we're going to get h on its own here we go times by r times by r that gives me um, uh, 12 minus h equals 3r, add h and take away 3r, so that will give me 12 um, equals 3r plus h, now take away 3r, 12 minus 3r equals h. Alright, so um, the last step, I suppose, is for us to uh, substitute this, which I've just worked out is h, into here for h. 
So pi r squared, pi times r squared times 12 minus 3r equals the volume. Uh, if I expand this out, that gives me 12, sorry, 12 pi r squared minus 3 pi r cubed equals v. Um, and that, that's it. Yeah, there you go. Whew, that was a tough question, but uh, there we go. So it's a pretty complicated uh, question, but it, it comes down to the relationship between uh, the, sorry, that's supposed to be a cone, between the height and the radius of the big cone versus the um, height and the radius of the little cone. And the fact that that is a consistent relationship is really important, okay?